Hello again everyone from Tokyo, Japan and welcome back to Japan Vintage Camera and Merry Christmas to everyone. Uh, Christmas here was uh, yesterday uh, and of course uh, elsewhere in the world is probably uh, Christmas evening right now. I hope everyone got what they wanted for Christmas and that you all had uh, wonderful holidays. Uh, I got a really nice gift for Christmas and I happen to be using it right now and it's the camera which I'm using to take this video. I finally got fed up with my uh, Canon G7X Mark III, which is probably a pretty good camera for uh, taking stills or doing uh, videos uh, for other purposes, but uh, for my purposes I didn't really like it so much, so uh, I finally moved up to a Lumix camera and that's what I'm using right now. Hopefully those of you who are watching the video and who have seen my previous videos have, uh, will notice some kind of improvement uh, in the detail and the focusing and uh, how close I can, uh, I can shoot with this uh, new camera. Uh, it's a very nice day here in Tokyo. Uh, yesterday and today it's uh, not as cold as uh, we would normally expect at uh, this time of winter. I know that in other places, especially North America, the cold is pretty extreme uh, recently. Uh, here in Tokyo it's quite nice, a little bit sunny out, and uh, uh, warm enough, well cold enough I have to wear a jacket, but not a really heavy one. Uh, last week we were up in Hokkaido in the Niseko area skiing. We were gone for one week and we had a wonderful time up there. Uh, the ski conditions were perfect, though it was quite cold, uh, hovering between uh, 10 and 15 degrees below zero, which is uh, cold even for Hokkaido uh, in December. Uh, the, the snow was really wonderful. Uh, I am kind of a new skier. I didn't learn to ski until just, uh, I guess, three or four years ago. And once I started, I, it's pretty much kind of like an addiction to me. And it's, it's very fun to go up there in the winter time and to be able to ski. And I'm looking forward uh, to going again once more this winter, though we don't have exact plans yet. But anyway, uh, it's been two minutes now. I'm sure some of you are probably not uh, interested in what uh, in anything other than a camera review. So I'll go ahead and start that right now. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, a really odd and unusual camera. One of the many odd and unusual cameras I've reviewed over the years here. Uh, this one is especially interesting because uh, it's not an especially common camera here in Japan and it's especially hard to find overseas. And this camera is the Lord uh, 4B uh, 35mm rangefinder camera which was released in 1958 and was an improved version of the Lord 4A which was released a couple of years before. Now the Lord camera company is kind of, has kind of an interesting history uh, like other Japanese uh, I guess uh, camera companies that's actually not the real name of the uh, company. Uh, the Lord camera company was actually the Okaya optical company and like other Japanese companies in the 1950s, they thought it would be a better idea to use English or anglicized uh, versions or names of their companies and models to make them more palatable to uh, overseas buyers. Uh, the 50s uh, were still rather close to the war era and a lot of people were still hesitant to buy things which were made in Japan or which were obviously Japanese. So uh, a lot of companies, uh, you know, uh, Nikon, uh, Konica, and of course Okaya Optical opted to use uh, English or English style names for their cameras and products. And in the case of the Okaya Optical Company, they decided to use the most English name they could find or think of and that was Lord. So kind of an odd choice for the name of a camera brand, but um, despite the odd choice of the name, the early Lord cameras were quite high quality and very well made cameras. Now I haven't had a lot of experience with these cameras. I, I've uh, tended to kind of uh, go along with the, the more mainstream makes and models, the kinds which have been uh, more popular uh, over the years and uh, still popular today. But uh, I saw a couple of these come up for sale. Uh, uh, about 10 days or just before we were going to Hokkaido and I, I, I went ahead and I, uh, I bought them and they were delivered while we were away and when we came back I opened the boxes and took them out and I was quite surprised at the real high quality of these cameras. And also that uh, Lord kind of went a different direction from other camera makers and they, they kind of went uh, all out in their own kind of design but with uh, a few touches which are kind of reminiscent of the old Leica Barnack cameras which a lot of Japanese companies copied in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, in this case, pretty much, you know, the, the most obvious thing is the shape of this top cover here, the way it goes around the shutter button 
and around the rewind knob here and though it doesn't look uh, so much like a Leica in this in this particular camera uh, there is a resemblance if you are familiar with Leica cameras or their various copies so there's a slight touch of the I guess uh, uh, Leica ancestry or a copy of the Leica ancestry in the Lord camera but other than that it's a much different and unique camera and it's an especially unique camera in several different ways, which I'll, I'll discuss as we go on through the video. So uh, let's go ahead and start uh, taking a look at the top of the camera and I'll point out the first most obvious and interesting feature this camera has. You, th you can see this really tiny uh, rewind knob here. This isn't actually the rewind knob, it's just the end of a pull out rewind lever. Now, when I saw this, I was quite amazed at the this design and how well thought it was. It was a wonderful idea to be able to, in a very small space, make a complete winding mechanism which had plenty of leverage for rewinding the film. And when it was rewound, you could just push out of the way and out of, uh, you know, uh, out of everything. Uh, it's a really clever design and something which I haven't seen on other cameras. And in the instruction manual for this camera, this is one of the features, of course, which they, they make kind of a big deal of. Uh, if you come across the instruction manual from this camera, it's only about four pages long and is written in rather bad English, uh, but uh, and doesn't really tell you much about how to operate the camera. It just kind of describes the features, and and I guess they assume the people who would buy this camera already knew how to use a camera, so there was no... Uh, uh, no need to describe how to operate the aperture or shutter speeds or anything like that. All you had to know was the unique features uh, which were relevant to this particular camera. Anyway, moving on here, we have a, a shoe for mounting a flash gun. And you can use any kind of flash with this camera. You can use an old bulb flash like they used back in the day. Or you can use a modern strobe flash. But uh, you'll have to use the flash sync socket here on the bottom. Uh, modern flashes often don't come with uh, an obvious uh, flash sync attachment. Often you'll find a plug on them somewhere where you can attach a cord to it. And if that's not the case, uh, of course you can find an adapter which fits between the flash and the camera body and which will uh, allow you to attach the cord to the sync socket. You can also use an accessory finder on this camera. And though this camera doesn't uh, use interchangeable lenses, so you know, it's not really necessary to have different finders for the lenses, there are some photographers who prefer to use a, a finder which allows you to get kind of like an SLR uh, point of view rather than the rangefinder point of view. One of the advantages which a lot of people uh, like about rangefinder cameras is you can actually see through the viewfinder more than what the lens sees. So you can kind of spot things coming into the frame or leaving the frame or whatever. And for a lot of people that's uh, a wonderful feature, but for other people it's something that they don't like so much. Uh, they prefer to have uh, a viewfinder where you just see exactly what the lens is seeing. And a photographer who comes to mind who uh, who was this way was James Revilius, who was an English photographer and did some really wonderful work back in the 1960s and 70s. And if you haven't heard of James Revilius, I recommend you look him up and take a look at his work. It's, it's really interesting. But he loved to shoot an old uh, Leica M3 with, I believe, a 35mm Summeron lens on it. And he always used the Leica viewfinder, which you can adjust for the different focal lengths. And when you do it, it kind of blacks out everything which you aren't actually going to see on the film. And he really loved this uh, kind of system on his Leica. Uh, for myself, I really love the the built-in uh, viewfinder of the M3. So uh, you know, uh, I get you know people have different tastes or different uh, attitudes when it comes to making art. And his was unique, but uh, uh, he really had a wonderful style, and he made some wonderful uh, photographs. Anyway, moving on from that part, we'll go over here to another uh, interesting part of the Lord 4B camera, and the 4A for that matter. And that's the, the winding mechanism, uh, the shutter control mechanism, and uh, the film counter. And that's kind of unique on this camera, and something which uh, works a little bit differently than uh, on other cameras. The most obvious thing with this camera is like the old Leica cameras and some other Japanese cameras of the era, it's a double stroke camera, which means that you have to wind the lever two times to cock the shutter and wind the film to the next frame. Uh, this was done in other cameras uh, to, uh, because it, the, I guess there were size constraints and engineering considerations which didn't give them a lot of room to make a full stroke shutter. And in the case of Leica, they said by uh, making it with uh, a double stroke system that would make a more reliable system. 
I'm not sure what the excuse is here, uh, but the camera has a very simple uh, short uh, travel double stroke system. Uh, you'll notice when you, and this is where I'll, I'll test the close-up capabilities of my Lumix camera here. When you wind the camera a couple of times, the shutter button pops up and maybe you can see there's a orange ring around the bottom and that lets you know that the shutter is charged and the camera is ready to fire. And when you depress the shutter, that disappears. And of course, when you wind it again a second time, it pops up. So this is a really wonderful idea for the film winding mechanism. It adds a little bit of complication to the inside of the camera, which uh, uh, I had to deal with with the other example of this camera, which I, I got. But it's a clever idea, and I really like how it's laid out. It's very easy to see, and uh, if you don't see the orange, you can obviously see that the shutter button is pointing up or sticking up much more than it was before. Uh, it's a really great idea. Uh, other cameras have done things like Olympus put a, uh, a charge indicator in the top of the uh, lens base here, which turns red when you uh, charge the shutter. And other camera manufacturers have put uh, a window on the back, which lets you know when it's charged. Uh, I think the system is the best of, uh, of the ones which I have seen. And the other feature here, this kind of funny little knob here that I'm pointing out with my finger. Uh, this is the film counter dial. And this was a feature which is mentioned twice by the uh, Lord Company in their manual. And what they mention is that this is a, uh, a film counter which counts downward rather than upward. And this is for those people who have a little bit of difficulty doing basic math. And so you say you load a, a, a 36 exposure roll of film and you're taking photographs and say you've gotten up to 20 exposures and you want to know how many you have left. If you use the conventional system, you have 36 and you have to subtract 20 to come up with 16. And I guess Lord thought that maybe some of the people who bought these cameras wouldn't be able to do math like that. So they, they introduced this system here, which counted downward. So if you put a 36 exposure roll of film in here, it shows 36. And as you count, as you take photos, it counts downward. So all you have to do is look at the counter and that shows you exactly how many uh, frames you have left. Uh, on the other hand, this doesn't uh, reset automatically. When you are going to reset the film counter, when you load the film, you have to push here on this dial or the, this button dial it's kind of difficult to do but you just turn it until the number 36 lines up with the little arrow in the center and or if you're shooting a 24 exposure roll of film uh, turn it until the 24 lines up and then you can go ahead and uh, operate the camera and it will count downward to telling you exactly how many frames you have left to go uh, on the bottom of the camera, we don't have very much here. We have kind of like a dummy button on this side, which doesn't do anything. Here we have the reset button for the uh, uh, film rewind mechanism. You push this down and this unlocks the film winding mechanism and allows you to rewind the film. And over here we have a standard quarter inch tripod socket. In the back of the camera, we have the viewfinder eyepiece, which has a nice uh, plastic uh, cover here, which prevent you from scratching your eyeglasses. And over here we have a, uh, a, a multiple exposure a button. This is something I, I don't recommend you use on this camera because sometimes you'll waste um, uh, a frame of film by trying to use it because you kind of, it kind of uh, uh, disengages the film winding mechanism but does allow you to uh, charge the shutter. But re-engaging the film winding mechanism sometimes takes an extra turn or two. So uh, though you may get uh, two exposures, your double exposures on the one frame of film, it will cost you another frame of film when you are using it, or it, at least it has in my experience. So I, I don't recommend using this unless, you, you know, unless you're aware of that. Uh, moving to the front of the camera, we have the viewfinder window and the rangefinder window. And this camera has a very nice viewfinder. It has a kind of a tall top cover compared to Leica or other uh, cameras of this era, which allows these uh, a large viewfinder, which of course gives you a brighter uh, field of view and makes it a little bit easier to compose and focus your image. Moving to the front, as this is a fixed lens uh, rangefinder camera, all the important controls and features are on the lens itself. Uh, the first thing we have here is this wonderfully smooth uh, focusing system and we have a focusing scale here which is arranged in feet. Uh, of course Okaya had intended to uh, export these cameras heavily which it never did. Uh, the few examples of these that you're likely to find outside Japan were probably brought home by service members and the occasional tourists who happened to visit Japan back in those days. Uh, so. Uh, uh, in feet, not in meters, or meters and feet like you find in other companies. Uh, behind this uh, uh, 
uh, focusing scale is the depth of field scale and this goes from uh, 2.8 to 16 and this lets you know how much depth of field you have at any given aperture and behind that we have this kind of funky little lever here and this is what is, is a called a, a snapshot feature and uh, with using the snapshot feature if you if you uh, turn it on and you are focusing there's kind of a detent which catches the focus distance between 7 and 10 feet which if you use it f8 pretty much uh, this is a good I guess what uh, the lower the camera company thought was a great uh, distance for taking snapshots and with a 40 millimeter lens that's kind of you know, kind of in between wide angle and standard uh, I, I guess it's a, it, it probably is an effective idea and this is one of the things which they marketed on this camera a feature which uh, other camera makers didn't have in their cameras um, I, I'm and I have to agree I haven't seen this feature in other cameras some of the half frame cameras have detents for say uh, a portrait or standing person or a group so you'll have like three focus detents plus infinity that's a little bit more sophisticated than this this system is uh, simpler and you can you can simply switch it off and the camera will focus without the detent which is uh, I, I think kind of a cool feature uh, the next thing we have here is the uh, aperture ring and this camera as I mentioned has a 40 millimeter lens it's an f 2.8 lens which is a improved and faster lens over the earlier uh, 4a camera this is a five element lens and it's a surprisingly uh, good performer uh, there isn't a lot of information available about these cameras and there aren't a lot of example photos available uh, showing what they are capable of doing but I was able to find some uh, good examples on Japanese sites from uh, Lord enthusiasts and I was quite surprised at the performance of this lens. Uh, it works really well. Uh, this camera features a copal shutter with a full range of speeds from bulb in one second to one five hundredth of a second. And one thing about these uh, cameras, you may notice if you buy one of these, uh, uh, you, if it's a lowered camera or another uh, model, that sometimes uh, the aperture will turn past. The ring will actually turn past the maximum aperture. And a lot of people will think that's uh, either a fault with the dial or the camera or that you can actually open the uh, aperture wider than the maximum aperture shown on the, on the lens. That's not actually the case. The reason this happens is because uh, Copal was a separate company uh, from the camera manufacturers and they manufactured uh, shutters uh, for a variety of different makers. You'll find Copal shutters on of course the Lord camera, on the various twin lens reflex cameras, the Konica rangefinder cameras, lots of different ones used it. Uh, but rather than make a shutter for each and every single camera and lens design, uh, they made a few different designs. And uh, camera makers, of course, uh, fitted their lenses or designed their lenses to work within uh, the specifications of the shutter. And there are some oddball ones like this where uh, the lens is just kind of in between size. It's not the smaller size, not the larger size, kind of in between. So uh, the aperture travels a little bit further or the aperture ring travels a little bit further than it might otherwise would. When you have it set to uh, f2.8 and you look through the lens, you'll see that the aperture blades line up precisely around uh, the opening of the lens. If you turn it any wider and you look through the lens, you won't see anything. The aperture actually does open wider as if we're going to say like f2, like it might if you, this were a Olympus uh, you know, 35 wide S or a, uh, a Konica 3. But since this has an f2.8 lens, of course the maximum aperture is f2.8. Now the 40 millimeter lens, uh, this, this is a wonderful lens, but there are some issues which you have to keep in mind when you are looking for one of these. And the biggest thing to look for is separation in the front element. So like lenses like the, uh, the Zeiss uh, Planar or Sonar, the front two lens elements in this camera are glued together and uh, sometimes they separate. And you can, you can spot the separation pretty easily by kind of like a a mirror effect or shiny effect on a uh, part of the edge of the lens or the part you know half of the lens or sometimes the entire lens where the two elements are separating and it's very easy to see through the front it's not so easy to see through the back and I've, I've shot uh, some lenses which have had uh, separation uh, I had a was it uh, a sonar lens and a uh, scimitar lens as well as a planar and a roller flex and honestly I couldn't really tell any difference in the performance of the lenses 
the Sonar lens which uh, I had, which had the separation, that was one of the best lenses I've, I've ever used. And I kind of regret selling that camera and lens because uh, even today I still look at some of the photos which I took with that and I kind of you know kick myself for letting it go. But uh, that's a thing to look for in this camera. And though it's not likely going to affect the, the images, the quality of the images, it will kind of affect the value because some people are kind of picky. They don't want to see that when they look in the front of the lens. So if you're looking in a camera shop and looking at one of these, make sure that it doesn't have uh, separation in the front. If you if you plan to uh, keep it as an investment or resell it in the future, if you're just going to shoot it, just go ahead and buy it and see if you can get a discount because it has separation in the lens. Uh, the 40 millimeter focal length is a wonderful focal length. As I said, it fits in between wide angle and uh, the standard size, wide angle being 35 millimeter and standard being about uh, 50 millimeter. So you'll be able to get a little bit more on your frame of film than you would with the 50 millimeter standard lens. But uh, uh, also it won't quite have that wide angle effect on your photographs. It's a really good uh, focal length and it became very popular in the late 60s and 70s. Uh, a lot of you are familiar with the, the Canonet QL17 or the Ashka GX or GL or the variety of 40mm SLR lenses which came out around that time. Uh, it's actually a really good and useful focal length and it's interesting to see it on a 1950s camera. So uh, I mentioned that I got a couple of these and as you can see this isn't a bad example of a camera. It's a fairly clean one uh, despite the fact it was made back in 1958. And though this isn't a, an especially common camera, uh, they did make a black paint version which I also happened to get. And I see these for sale from uh, time to time in Japan. They're not exceptionally rare though they are kind of hard to find. And uh, when I got this, I was really amazed at the quality of the paint. It's kind of like the paint which they put on the early uh, uh, Canon rangefinder cameras like the, the Canon P or the VT or uh, uh, the V1 the series or 6 series, however you want to call them. Uh, which is actually better than what they put on the later cameras like the the Canon 7 or even the the Leica M series I really love the glossy like uh, shiny enamel finish of the black paint on this camera and uh, uh, Another interesting thing about these cameras and one thing you might want to keep in mind is if you're going to use a filter on this camera uh, it doesn't have a threaded filtering on the front the threads are around actually the outside of the front lens element and you kind of have to screw and unscrew to put on a filter. As you can see, this one has a chrome lens ring, and to make the camera look entirely black, they put this adapter, which you would thread on the outside. Now, I, I really liked this camera when I got it, the black one. I, I've wanted one of these for quite a while when I saw one in a camera shop, and they're fairly pricey here. I got this one because it was kind of a, a non-working uh, paperweight and I had to go to a lot of work in this. I had to uh, readjust the levers for operating the shutter and the uh, shutter charging system and then I found the bulb setting didn't work and when I went to do that I found that uh, the slow speed something or other part was broken and so I was able to get one out of another copal shutter and uh, kind of uh, put it together and uh, now it works. I'm quite happy that when you when you really dig into something like you um, take apart an engine in a car and you put it back together and you turn the key and it actually starts and runs, it's kind of a wonderful rush you get when when that happens. Especially when you think that you know uh, you're, you probably did something wrong or forgot something along the way. And it's kind of the sensation I got with this camera because it's the first time I've actually worked on one of these, and uh, I'm quite happy with the results. But anyway. Uh, it's been kind of a long video, longer than I expected, and that's going to be it for my discussion about the Lord 4B camera. If you happen to come across one of these, I really recommend it. As I said before, uh, keep in mind the issues with uh, uh, separation of the front lens, but other than that, a very sound, smooth, and easy to use fully mechanical camera. Uh, for those of you who uh, want to see more uh, cameras, uh, or I guess vintage camera videos, I plan to be making more of these soon. Uh, we're still kind of in the holiday season here, so it's kind of slowed down my video production a little bit. But uh, following the holiday season, I should hopefully get back on track to being putting out a, a video every week or so. Uh, and of course, if you click the like button, that really helps. That gets a few more people here to um, enjoy uh, looking at, at and hearing about vintage uh, cameras and film photography. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you tune in again soon.